Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode number 11 of the Step One Podcast, where we help you take your first step or your next steps in business and in life. And my guest this week is a nationally quoted labor and employment and sports attorney, also a dear friend. Uh, kind of crazy how we connected and are staying connected, so uh, we'll dive into that shortly. Yep. But he's also the creator and host of the Quarter Four Podcast, covering the, uh, the intersection between business and sports by talking to some of the most successful people in sports and unpacking how they achieve greatness in their field. So some rules and asks for everyone listening here today before we dive into today's podcast. Of course, number one, knowledge without implementation is really just entertainment. So make sure you take massive levels of action on all the notes that you do take today. And I'll be taking some notes as well. So make sure you take some massive levels of action. Number two is uh, any questions or comments or anything like that, put them down below. We'll, we're going to make sure that we get back to you uh, and answer any questions that you have uh, as things go uh, or time goes on. And number three, and most importantly, is do not be selfish. Share this with the people in your life. Share this with your colleagues, your friends, your family. People need to hear this information. We're going to unpack a lot. So let's dive into uh, introducing my guest, Michael Elkins. All right, we're going to dive into his bio real fast. Michael spent a large portion of his legal career as a partner in a mid-sized and large firm. He's also, uh, he had, sorry, he had a traditional law firm. Uh, um, uh, doesn't really use social media, but the news idea, uh, new ideas are awesome. Ch uh, changes from uh, change is evil, and realize that he didn't change his mindset. He would have, you know, he would be end up being a dinosaur in the field of uh, the 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 law field. So he ended up making some major adjustments. Where again, we're going to dive into shortly. But because of this, he's decided to take the leap of faith to do something that no other lawyer has started doing, which is start his own podcast, which he's been crushing, which has been amazing. And uh, on top of that, uh, he's really just doubled down and tripled down on his uh, uh, social media performance. And Michael. Welcome to the show, my friend. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Finally. Likewise. Finally. <laughs> finally. We've been trying for so long, man. So, yeah. Mike, um, so I want to dive into so much. You know, first and foremost, I want to know how you got to where you are today. And I want to start with as young as you can possibly remember. I want to know the whole backstory. I know we've chatted a long, long time ago about all this. Yeah. But remind um, me a little bit. That's a great question. You know, I I had a really traditional path as, as, as young, you know, I think being a lawyer really suited me right when I was younger because I talked a lot and um, I was hyper hyper analytical as a kid that's sort of been told to me across you know my parents and grandparents when they were alive and aunts and uncles so the path to being a lawyer seemed really natural for me but I really always looked at it as a really traditional path right I I didn't realize I had like an entrepreneurial spirit um, even though I had an entrepreneurial spirit, I don't know if that makes sense. I didn't, um, I didn't fully understand that. So I started practicing law in 2001 and I was at this, uh, small sort of silk stocking labor and employment boutique in Miami, which was, you know, that law firm at the time was kind of a big to do, but it was really traditional. I mean, very, very like, you know, to the point where associates should be seen, not heard, you know, get in your office, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., bill your hours, do what you're told, go home, come back, do it all over again. So I started trying to bring some business in as a literally two-month lawyer. I brought in this client. They wanted me to do like non-compete work and handle some lawsuits. And I remember the owners of that firm, they were not happy. If you can believe that, they really looked at me like, well, that's nice, Michael, but you know, we really, that's great that you want to bring in business, but we want to train you our way. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? Like, I'm trying to bring you revenue. So I left because it was a big enough piece of business. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go do this on my own. So that was my first entrepreneurial venture, which was opening my own firm back in 2003. Um, so you asked me to go all the way back. So I love it. I did, I did that for four and a half, five years. Now that's pre Facebook, pre social media. So that was literally pounding the pavement, hustling in terms of passing out business cards, going to in-person networking events every night. And it worked for a period of time. The problem with that was, and I think entrepreneurs face this all the time. In fact, I'm skeptical of an entrepreneur that doesn't have this story. The problem was I was an idiot. I mean, I could practice law and that was great, but I was immature and I didn't, can we swear on this or do you Of course. No, I didn't it. know shit about running a business, man. I had, I had no mentors telling me or helping me. In fact, I think I was so arrogant. I didn't want mentors. And so I promptly ran that first law firm 
right into the ground, literally. How old were you? <laughs> I was, well, it was 2007 that it ended. So that was, what year are we in? That was 14 years ago. I'm 46 now. So 31, 32 years old. Still wow. young though, right? And most lawyers are not partners at 30 or 31. So although I ran the firm business-wise into the ground and there was a lot of stuff swirling around there, Hurricane Wilma hit us. It hit my law firm hard, and, and I learned a valuable lesson there because our office got destroyed. And of course, I didn't have business interruption insurance because I didn't even know what that was at the time, despite being a litigator, because I was an idiot. And there's no excuse, right? That's the, that's the reason. What happened? I was an idiot. You know, you got to own your shit, right? So I was able to latch on with a law firm, a, a good law firm in Florida, um, as a partner, because I still had my book of business. That was the key to that whole situation. I had built up a nice little book of business. So despite the fact that my law firm wasn't running tip top, I still had a ton of clients. So I spent uh, from 07 until 2000 and end of 2018 at two different law firms as a partner, uh, both in running the labor and employment divisions or at least assisting in that. And then the entrepreneurial spirit uh, came back without me even really wanting it to, or, you know, of some business decisions happened at my former law firm that came out of nowhere and were a problem. And I had to make a choice and I had to make that choice fast. Right. Um, and at that time, about 2017, which is right around when you and I met, by the way, uh, I started looking at the area of law, the world of law, I was still at another law firm and realizing, you know, if I don't start changing my ways, I'm going to be a dinosaur by the time I'm 45 at the time. That's what I'd said. And so I started playing around with Instagram a little bit. I just started a podcast out of nowhere at the time that that medium was still sort of new. Right. And I started seeing like, Hey, wait a minute, how come I need to be promoting my business on social media? Like, and that was, that's all very like traditional Gary V stuff. Right. I mean, that's, that's who I found started listening to a lot of Gary Vee, Tony Robbins. But my law firm at that time was not 100% thrilled with that. In fact, I'd say they were not thrilled, period. Um, I had gotten some national press in the New York Daily News commenting on the, the legalities or the possibilities of, of what was going on with Colin Kaepernick at the time. I wasn't commenting politically. I was commenting on his union grievance because that's what I do. I'm an employment lawyer. And that was not met with um, praise or love from my firm, despite the fact that I had been quoted in a national publication, they weren't thrilled about that. So there was clearly diverging views, right? So this, this marriage was gonna end one way or the other. It was forced, forced ended because there were some business decisions that were made that I could not live with. So I had to make decisions quick. But fortunately, I had the benefit of this horrible experience between 03 and 07 when I was an idiot and crashed my business, right? So I was able to take advantage of that. I had built up a little bit of a social media presence. I still had my business and I had mentors, right? I had learned that I don't know everything in the world. I learned, I understood that, you know, arrogance and, you know, thinking you're a know-it-all is not gonna help you succeed. So I was much better positioned to make the leap again in 2019 to open MLE Law. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a great ride since. And so very non-traditional firm now, right? Social media is a big part of what I do. Podcasting, big part of what I do, doing stuff like this and how you and I met, right? Which, which attending conferences of the people that I want to learn from. I know you go to Tony Robbins stuff and you and I met at a very intimate uh, Gary V event back in 17 in Jersey. I'm sure you obviously remember that. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, so, wow. First off, I mean, there's a lot to unpack from what you yeah. had story wise. Um, I, and actually, I just want to ask you a few things. So, yep. were were you the kind of person who knew like your whole life you wanted to be an attorney, or is yes. that? I did. Yeah, it was what I, I. I mean, I was born to do this. I played around with other ideas, right? I went through a phase where I was like, I want to work for a sports team. I want to, you know, maybe do some stuff in the travel industry, and you know. I think you talked about this before. I've been following your content and, and I agree at some point you got to pick something and go, you, you got to dive into that. Right. Yeah. So I was a lawyer for a while and I was always like, well, I don't know, but this is what I was born to do. I mean, I love, 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 love what I do. 
Now, there will be a lot of lawyers that don't like it. There's a lot of miserable attorneys out there, but I think that's because of the type of law they're doing. You know, I, I do labor and employment primarily, and it's fun. I have great clients. It's a high level area of the law. I'm in court all the time. I'm trying cases, jury trials, arbitrations. I'm arguing, which I love doing, arguing on paper and writing, which I'm a big fan of in federal court. Lots of strategy. I, I work, I have my own firm, but I work with my best friend. He has his own firm, Joshua Enton of Enton Law Group. We went to law school together. We've kind of got a new model of doing this instead of merging our firms and both being partners. We work cases together, but we have separate law firms. So we don't ever have to fight over the business bullshit that lawyers fight over, right? And we're trying cases, crisis management and hustling, and it's awesome. So that's, that's amazing. It's a roundabout way of saying, yes, I always did want to do this, but this is the way to do it if you're going to be a lawyer. I mean, it's stressful. It's a lot, but it's, it's awesome. Like the, the juice that comes from it, the adrenaline, I love. So yeah. I love that so much. So <laughs> when, uh, let's talk about the first time you got into starting your own practice years ago. Yeah. So, you know, late 20s, hungry, ready to rock and roll. I mean, kind of just dived head first into it. <laughs> Yep. Uh, similar, similar to me in the real estate world. Right. And um, I, I'm just so curious because I, I feel like, you know, it is a liberating feeling. Yes. You know, going out on your own. Obviously, it's scary as all hell. Yep. And, you know, you, you kind of are just winging it. But I am curious is like, what do you feel like, you know, looking back now, uh, you could have done differently? Yeah. In, in starting up your own firm and that maybe would have, you know, it brought you to where you were at faster? That's a great question. I think um, admitting, knowing what I didn't know, I thought I knew everything. I was arrogant. Um, I was a pain in the ass, I think. I, and I was stupid. I think, I mean, I was immature. And I make no excuses for that. Those are, they are what, that is what it is. There's no, it doesn't really matter the reason, right? It's kind of like one of those things, like whatever your problems are at the end of the day, nobody really cares. I mean, yeah. you just have to own your shit or you're never going to get better. So I thought I knew it all and I didn't want to listen to anyone. And that included the woman that I was partners with at the time. And I didn't know anything. I really didn't. And it's, it, it was a great lesson because it was a good practice. I mean, we were making money. I had cases, lots of clients. I, all the law stuff was fine. That was not my issue. I just ran a business terribly. I didn't understand anything about planning for disasters. I didn't understand about savings. You know, I'm a young 20 something making money in South Florida. I mean, forget it, right? I'm running around, spend, you know, it, it's the typical story. I mean, it's really not that different, right? I'm spent, I get it and I'm spending it. And I wasn't, I wasn't buying like fancy cars or stuff like that, but I'm like traveling up to Fenway Park and buying, you know, home front row home plate seats to Red Sox Yankees and going to Super Bowls and just, being an idiot and not listening to people, right? And luckily I didn't burn bridges. That wasn't, that wasn't the problem, but I was terrible at managing a business. I had no real vision and I had no sense of where do I want to be and what do I need to do to get me there? I was just like, go, 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 go. No game plan, no mentors, no, no even awareness to ask someone, hey, how, how should I treat this, right? I, I just thought I knew everything. So, yeah, I can relate a lot, <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot. And, uh, right. you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, it really is on us to see those things, be self-aware yeah. of what's going on financially and in our businesses and realize, realize our weaknesses and either hire to them or strengthen them because, you know, right. don't get me wrong in a lot of ways, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, you see in books of like, focus on your strengths. So I think Gary even talks about that focus on yes. your strengths, but in business, when you're the only entrepreneur, when you're the one, you can't ignore your weaknesses when That's a right. lot of it, a lot of it is managing money and leadership and all these things where I just was focused on my strengths and ignored those yeah, for me a too. long time. Right. Me too. And, and I think, you know, I, I'm a big fan of taking those weaknesses. I'm not trying to make my weaknesses my strengths. That's not what I'm trying to do. Because I think, for me, I think that would be sort of a waste of energy and a waste of time. Like, I do play to my strengths, but I make sure I identify these weaknesses and I get help with them. So when it comes to money, right, I have a financial advisor that I trust implicitly who handles a lot of my affairs. And when I want to go do something that's sort of 
bigger, right? I'm going to go spend some money on something. I talk to him. I say, hey, listen, this is what I'm thinking of doing. What do you think? Where does this fit in the grand plan? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? You know, my, my colleague Josh and I are looking at buying a building, right? We want to buy it. We don't want to rent. I don't want to rent space. That's a waste of money. So I'm talking to my people, my circle about what does that look like? How do you, how does that work? Instead of just running out, buying a building and do we want to buy a building we're going to rehab and what does that look like? And yeah, so I think you got to know those weaknesses, but you said it, right? If you're not self-aware and you're going to be the guy that thinks he knows everything, then I think you're dead. I just think you're dead. You got to just own your shit. That's the bottom line. hundred percent. And it, it really does start with self-awareness and it's realizing that like, listen, like no, nobody really teaches any of this and that's okay. okay. And being honest with yourself, like, you know, a bigger thing that, um, you know, I had to work through is having tougher conversations with my staff. I had a, you know, I had to work on my strategies with money. I had a, you know, I had to rewire everything. Yep. Me no, too. One te- no one teaches you that stuff, you know? And like, and I worked, no. I learned at a very young age of, you know, the hiring and firing, but like it sort of ended there. You know, and yeah. I can I can manage okay, but you know, being a leader is something different. Yep. And not enough people put enough weight on like, listen, like going to a leadership training is actually really helpful. <laughs> you know, yeah, of course. You know, and don't put it past yourself. I mean, so like, um, let's dive into this, right? So, uh, I want to talk about this really fast, actually. If you were going to go back, and we'll kind of reiterate different questions about this because I think yeah. it's important for my viewers. Where it's like, if you were going to go back and talk to your younger self now about that, you know, the way you structured your firm, what do you think would be like maybe just one piece of advice you'd give yourself? I hate to repeat it, but I I have to, you don't know everything. And so you need to get some mentorship. You need to seek out the people that you want to be like in, as in the future. Right. So it's like going to those conferences, like where we met at the Gary V conference, you know, at that time I was all in on Gary V and I still think Gary V is great. And I've had his brother on my podcast. I mean, I'm not listening to Gary Vee every day anymore because that messaging, I think I've sort of, that's sunk in. But I was like, I'm going to go to this conference because I'm interested in what this guy has to say. More importantly, I'm interested in connecting with like-minded people, right? I wasn't doing that back in the day. I I wasn't getting help on managing a law firm. I wasn't connecting with other like-minded people in any sense. I wasn't getting any mentorship. And by the way, it was offered. I just scoffed at it. I was like, ah, I got this covered. I don't need that. Uh, so the letter to my younger self would lead off with, you don't know everything. And in fact, there's a whole lot you don't know. The only thing I knew, the only thing was how to get clients and how to practice law. And that's great. You can't have a law firm unless you can do those things. But if you don't do the other stuff, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Yeah, I, see that. I think that's so important to, to, to touch on because I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs where a lot of the time they do start just like you and I, where we worked for somebody else. Yep. Right. And we get that experience and we go, I don't like this, yeah. you know, and I, I, I want more freedom and uh, suited uh, for this. <laughs> exactly. It's like, wait, there's something I'm right here. So we go try it on our own. And I think that, you know, because we're great salespeople, we think that we can become great business people and we definitely can become them. But I feel like just a lot of the time, I think a lot of people jump ship way too early. Yep. You know, and, agree. And, and to me, looking back, I, I love what you said. I think that's really powerful. And I think I would have spent more time studying the business side and learning the business side of things and mastering the money part before I would have jumped. So you had multiple ventures though, right? If I'm remembering right, you've talked about that. Like you were kind of had, you, you had- I was, you were, I was all over. I yeah, over. you were spread like thin almost. Yeah. And how did you pull out of that? My Tony Robbins coach was literally, listen, right. listen, kid, you know, it's like, you know, what wildly successful person have you ever studied that had five companies at 23? And I was like, no one I've, no one I've ever read about. <laughs> he's like, yeah, exactly. You're not about to be the first. Right. So uh, he's like, that, I, dedicated 10 years, you know, he's like, focus for 10 years and, you know, you'll be shocked to where you can be. And I think what you said makes sense. And I had to do this too, is when you kind of realize whatever you're doing isn't working. You know, I went through a very short phase of where it was, you know, everybody else's fault, right? It wasn't nothing, nothing was my fault, God forbid. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, it's all my fault. Even if it's someone else's fault, it's still my fault. It doesn't matter. Like everything, everything that happens is within the, I have to focus on my control, right? If, if it's someone else's fault, I brought that person into my orbit. So there's something going on there with me, right? And I can't control what they do. I can only control me. 
And you have to have really hard conversations with yourself. That's hard to do. I, I yes, found it hard. Anyway. Yes. That's, that's tough, man. When you start doing it, then once you do it and you're like, wait a minute, this is part of growth. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> so, um, it's hard to start that, that though. Hard yeah, to start I mean, that. I, I give you a lot of credit. Um, and I, I think that it's so powerful when people can realize that, and I mean, you could say however it is, just taking 100% responsibility for your life and for your situation. Yep. And it's not, a, it's not a beating yourself up thing. It's more oh. of a, listen, it's a self-awareness thing. Like, it's good. Take your ownership and say, like, listen, now that you've taken ownership, which is the first step, and have that self-awareness, now you can move forward from it. Now you can I, grow from it. Right, because right? because if you ignore it and you keep pointing fingers at other people saying it's their fault, you can't grow past it. That's right, right? and you're actually holding yourself back. You'll be stagnant, I and mean, that applies whether you're running your business or even your day to day life. Right, I mean, you know, I've had situations come up even recently. Things are crazy personally for me right now. There's all these different things happening, but you know, you got the contractor's not here when he's supposed to be here. You could complain about that, and that's fair. Acknowledge, like, wow, they were supposed to be here, but. Complaining isn't going to get anybody there. Like you have to catch yourself complaining and go, all right, wait a minute. The guy's not here on time. Let me, I got to find a way to solve this. It doesn't matter. You know, you can't just sit there and wallow in the complaint. You got to do things. And that's the whole idea, I think, of taking charge of your life, right? Why something bad happened? I mean, it has some relevance, I think, in, in maybe learning. But really, the question I always go to is, what am I going to do to solve the bad thing that's happening. It doesn't really matter what the bad thing is. How am I going to fix it? That's control. That's what I can control. What do I do? And it took me exactly. a long time to figure that out. <laughs> I, I only know how to look at life and solutions. I yeah. know somebody, you know, one of my staff will bring me a problem or a right. challenge. And all I can think my mind immediately goes, what are the solutions? What are my right. options? And what can I yeah. control? That's right. Because if you wallow in why this happened, and maybe the why is part of the solution, right? So it doesn't happen again, or maybe you know, that's fine. But if you're just going to complain about it happening, that's not going to solve anything. No, and you're wasting time. Yeah, 100%. You know, it, it, I wish it, I could tell. I, that's the letter to my younger self too, right? Like, you know, you, you have to control what you can control. You control your life. Stop complaining about other stuff because nobody cares. They really don't at the end of the day. They really yeah. don't. I, I couldn't agree more. And like when you, when you realize that time is actually our greatest commodity, right? Yeah. Our greatest asset. And you, and I now I'm just so protective of my time. It's still, right. same here. You know, in my, in my emotional state too, where it's like, all I have is my emotional state. Right. And it's like, why would I spend any of it in, in not in a blissful, happy, you know, carefree emotional world? And that, that's so true. And people go to the whole, you hear people say, well, you made me feel A, B, C, and D. And my response to that, not that people are saying that a lot to me, but my response to that is, you know, I wish I had the power to make people feel certain things. I mean, those are choices, right? And so it took me a long time to figure out that if I'm not feeling a certain way, right, if things aren't good emotionally for me, that is not someone else's doing or problem. That's my problem. And maybe I need to reevaluate the people I'm associating with, or how I'm reacting to things, because I only control me. Don't control someone else. Someone calls me a son of a bitch. I mean, that, that doesn't happen. But you know, if they did, I can choose to believe that or not. But it's my choice. It's not, they didn't do anything. So I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, it's like how we're reacting to the stimulus of others. How we're that's reacting right. to their actions. Oh and, my God, yeah. You know, I was at a conference recently and it was talking about how you need to shift from reactive to responsive or That's responsible. Right. And it's like, again, we have 100% control on how we act based right. on our emotions. You feel how you'd like to feel and you can't really control your emotions. You can control how you react or act about your emotions. That's right. I mean, if you're angry, you should feel angry. If you're jealous, you should feel that. You should let that flow over you. Just you though. Don't, that's not something you put on someone else. And, and I've always said to people, you, of course you can't stop how you feel. We're not robots, we're human beings, right? But if you're angry, then step back. You, you, can, you have a choice on how to react to that anger. You can literally say, I'm really angry right now. I'm just gonna sit with this. I'm gonna grab this pillow and I'm gonna squeeze it. And then in a couple hours, I'm gonna think about this a little bit differently. So I, 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 that's a huge part of what I try to do um, and, and I'm sure you, have, you do that in law, you know, I mean, oh you do, God. it's so much emotion, 
you it's know, tons it, of emotion. <laughs> it is. And, and you've got to be strategic, right? So you can't just fire off nasty emails. You can't just go crazy, right? You've really got to kind of get, get it together, dial it back or try to at least and then approach it, you know, from a responsive standpoint, not a reactionary standpoint. So I mean, that's, I'm curious right. to get this right. So like what I've learned to do for me that works is anytime I'm speaking with somebody and emotions come over me and we're texting or emailing or whatever, uh, whether it's in a deal or personal life, I type out the email or I type out the text message and I let it sit for a day. I'll delete it. Right. Yeah. I'll do that too. I mean, I, I'll type it out. I'll get it all out on paper. You son of a bitch, blah, 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 everything. And then I'll look at it and go delete. <laughs> and I feel better. Sure. I love that. So like, I, I, so I'm curious just because obviously in your position, you're dealing with, uh, you know, obviously I feel like in both of our careers, we deal with a lot of emotion. Um, oh my God. Yeah. I'm sure you like, do all the time. Yeah. All the time. Right. So I, um, you know, I am curious though, because in your world you have to, you know, I guess in business in general, but in your world specific, you have to be a masterful communicator masterful yes, and you know and we use attorneys every day in our deals right sure. obviously in your world it's a little different because you focus more on employment law correct correct yep cool so that all being said it's just like you know i also feel like you also represent both sides a lot right i primarily employers but i will do employee work if it's a good case so i've had cool. some employees work over the years um primarily though i'm representing management or the defense but i definitely do employee work for sure so again, because like we were just talking about like our emotional states, I feel like, you know, you have people who come in and are just out of their mind, berserk, pissed, frustrated, you yeah. know, and, and it's, and it's more about like, okay, but like, what is the end goal here? What is the results we're trying to get? Not so much. What is, how is it making you feel? Clearly it's right. not making you feel great, but how do we work through this? You know? And I, yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it in, in the employee, look, the emotions run on both sides employer and employee. Everyone thinks, Absolutely. oh, it's the employees, but it, that's not necessarily true. You know, employers don't like when they think they're being taken advantage of. They don't like when they think employees are, you know, accusing them of things they didn't do. That's very emotional, right? If you're, I mean, I handle a lot of employment discrimination. If you're accused of being a racist or being a misogynist, or that's tough as an employer. So I get it. And you're right. We, everything has to be done in the context of like, what's the goal here? And let's remove, let's try to remove the emotion and address the facts and apply the facts to the law. And that's hard. I get it. That's hard for clients to do, whether it's individuals or businesses. And you're right. You have to try to communicate that. And oftentimes I find myself saying to clients, business or individual, look, my job here is to not be emotional. You, you are paying me to be objective, to deal with the facts. And I, I, I I'm empathetic to your emotions here. However, those emotions generally aren't going to help us. You see that a lot in deposition prep. That's where it's really important when you're prepping the witness. Um, and, and some of them, I, I, I represent a young woman who's an owner of a business who got sued. And I thought for sure when they took her depo, she was going to be an emotional basket case. I was convinced of it the night before. I was so worried. She got in there. Yes, no short answers, stoic all the way through, never got uh, bothered by anything. So, you know, it works sometimes. And then sometimes, you know, I've had clients go off the rails. That's I can only imagine. I mean, like, look, I mean, you know, these people are just, they're, um, they're, in their emotions, like a lot yeah. when this happens. And I agree with what you said. So, and I want people to hear this who have small businesses and realize like, listen, like, especially when you're starting to hire employees, because I want to dive into some protective things that people can do sure. as, uh, for, for um, smaller entrepreneurs, right? Yep. And I just feel like when you become an employer, and first off, you know, in my eyes, it's like you, you need employees. Like you can't do it all alone. Stop thinking you need to do it all alone. Um, right. Staff should help you excel and build a free life and, you know, allow you the freedom to live your life because your business is not your life, right? It's right. just support it. It's one of the baskets. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that people just need to realize that like, listen, you're going to feel a lot of types of ways about your staff. It's yeah. very, very normal. Yep. <laughs> right. And they're, and your staff also is going to feel lots of ways about their boss. That's just yes. how it is. Very normal. Very normal. And, right. And, and, we both parties are just going to work every day trying to do their best and realize it's we're all human beings right yeah, and we're all just 100%. trying to do our best we're all going to feel stuff so like you know there's no reason to to um 
to feel these, you know, let it fester or let it build up and become these major problems. Because listen, again, they're your staff. They need direction. That's why you're they're your staff. And Absolutely. you should also be open to the feedback of saying, hey, this isn't working and not take it personally because they also are most likely most of the time when they're giving you feedback is trying to help you. Absolutely. Right? And so, it's your business. So it's going to be different, right? I mean, they don't own your business. You own it. So it's, it's your baby. It's not their baby. And you have to recognize that as a business owner. It's just the reality of it. Yeah. Nobody's going to care about it as much as you do. And they sure. shouldn't, by the way. Agreed. <laughs> that's why they're your staff. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just well, the bottom line. Exactly. So it's, it's incumbent upon you, I think, as a leader to try to get your staff to really buy into your culture, right? I mean, Michael Lombardi taught me this and it's really so true. It all starts with culture when you're talking about running an organization. I don't care what business you're in. And I've talked about this in employment law. You want to avoid getting sued for employment discrimination, build good culture. I'm not saying that you can, if you have good culture, you can run out and discriminate. But man, I see a lot of cases where it's clear there was not discrimination, but the culture was so toxic that it's being taken that way. And I've seen a lot of cases where the culture is so great that we've been able to resolve issues that there was no discrimination, but somebody got a little bit upset. But because of the corporate culture and because of how everybody cared, they were able to work it out. So my biggest tip, build, cult, build good culture. It's preeminent in any organization. You want to succeed, build good culture, 100%. So true. So yes. true. And I feel like you can get ahead of so many possible issues if you have great culture. Like things that I do is I, I implement feedback sessions right? where people are, where it's a safe space where everyone can share their feedback yeah, and, and tell me exactly how they feel. And I get to share exactly how I feel. And it's not a judgmental space. It's just a, Hey, I'm feeling this way. And mm -hmm. Hey, I'm feeling that way. Let's work on both of them and say, thank you and move forward. That's right. That's right? a good way to avoid problems. And absolutely. And it's like, I'll be able to catch things. And you know, a big thing that I had to learn, you know, that, um, you know, that I would hire people and they get really close with people, like super close. Right. And I had to realize that like, that is a recipe for disaster most of the time. Of course. Right? Yeah. You, there's a difference between being friends and being friendly. And I didn't yes. know that. And it's uh, especially when you have a small team, you become close very quickly because sure. you see each other all the day and you're talking all the time. But right. you know, for people like a building great culture is a foundational pillar when building a great company. hundred you know? percent. You can't starts, be a, oh, yeah. go ahead. So as I say, it, start, it starts with culture. It starts, it starts with building a, an environment of growth, an environment of, uh, of, of you know, um, where people can feel like they can go out and build and create and feel happy and safe and supported. You know, you, you know you're not going to see a team with a legacy of winning. You, I mean, there are, there are teams that win that didn't have great culture, but they're one-offs mostly. Um, but any team that's built a legacy, they built it on culture. I mean, they had talent, obviously, but listen, the Patriots didn't win for 20 years just because they had the most talented players. In fact, they didn't always have the most talented players. I know they had Brady, but it wasn't all Brady, right? I mean, there was a lot of culture and a lot of years that went into building that culture. So, and any great business, you know, Apple, Netflix, any of these companies, culture built it. Now, someone probably will come back, snap back and go, well, what about Amazon? They have terrible culture. Well, not in the beginning, <laughs> not when they first built it. When they first built it, they had great culture. Now they've, you know, got different issues. But yeah, sure. I, I think it's all about culture. And you, if you're the owner, it starts with you. Exactly. We're just about to say that. Yeah. If you don't set that tone, you cannot expect anybody to to follow a path, right? To be on this good culture growth path if you're not engendering that with your people. So if you're the owner, it starts and stops with you. I don't care. You and even if that goes, if you hire somebody and they're a bad seed. Well, I got news for the owner. You hired him. <laughs> so maybe we need to talk about that. So, yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. I think that for a lot of uh, first time entrepreneurs or smaller companies, you know, with a few, maybe a few employees, they, um, they don't realize because like what they're real, I feel like what happens a lot of the time is that at the beginning of most entrepreneurs careers, you hire two positions and you just hire for work purposes and re don't realize that again, you're building actually your team. Right. Right. And that team is going to go to battle every day. 
And if you're not treating it like a team, like an organization, instead of just like, hey, did you get your paperwork done? It's not just about the work, right? I mean, you are a team and need to work together to accomplish a greater mission uh, every year, right? And yeah. really every day. And and it, it's like, I, I couldn't agree more with the whole, it starts with you. And that's why like I'm obsessive, obsessive about growing because my company will not outgrow me. My staff right. will not outgrow me. Right. So, you know, thankfully it's not physically or we'd be five foot four or five foot five. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's so important to make sure you're pushing on that. And I think people hire, you, you, like you talked about it, right? You're hiring for the work, but I sort of take a different viewpoint. See, I think the hiring model as it is today is, is completely outdated, especially with lawyers. You know, and I preached this at my old firm and believe me, it, it got, did not get a positive response, but you know, we hire people and we, we do this interview, right? We look at a resume, we do an interview and maybe we bring them back for a second interview and we decide we're going to hire them. So we're getting married, right? Or we're going to live together based upon one or two really boring dates. I think it's terrible, actually. I always told my firm and, and for me, if I'm going to hire, it's going to be on a working interview, right? And I'm not so concerned about the, the ability to, I mean, I'm concerned about the ability to do the job. Don't misunderstand me. But a lot of stuff, if it's like a basic staff position, that stuff can be taught. I'm really more concerned about the person, right? How do they handle situations A, B, C, and D? I can teach you our systems. I can teach a lot of that stuff, but I can't teach how you're going to fit in a crisis situation. And if it's a lawyer, then yeah, you got to have a certain amount of education and ability, but I would much rather bring someone in for a week and do a working interview for a week. Like, listen, come on in. I'm going to throw you into all this different craziness and let's see how you and I respond to it together. Because an interview is bullshit, personally, I think. I mean, everyone's on their best behavior. The resume is bullshit. You never, no one's ever going to give you a bad reference. Like, if I, if I call the references someone gives me, is someone really going to tell me they suck? No way. I'd rather just bring them in. Let's do a working interview and let's see if we can fit. So. I think that's powerfully said too, because I, you know, a lot of people, you know, and I've made the mistake where you kind of just go, ah, they're friends. Why don't I just bring them in? I mean, yeah. like, right. And I think, you know, especially at the beginning of your career, cause you're sort of like, you know, like, listen, for me, I was 20 freaking three when I was hiring people, you know, like my yeah. first employees, until I was 23 sure. years old. I had, you know, six staff. I mean, like it was just, yeah. you know, um, you know, so I was, the only way I could find people was through friends of friends and, yeah. you know, Nowadays, I mean, now I, now it's a completely different model. My, I like what you're saying. I think that's really important because I think a lot of people uh, don't understand that, like, no matter what you say to them, they're going to give you the best answer that you possibly can imagine on your interview. Yeah. I like the working interview model a lot. I, I've realized that for me, that um, what I do is I do kind of 30 day probationary periods at the beginning yep. of every hire. I, like, Listen, I give a lot of people opportunities because I believe a lot of people can show up and. Like, I, I like, listen, in the next 30 days, one of two things are going to happen. Either you're going to have a really good experience and things work, or you're not going to be thrilled, or I'm not going to be thrilled, and we just part ways. It has nothing to do with you personally or me personally. It's just not a good fit. Right. And Absolutely. That's, it. that's a great way to do it. It's, it. At least you're doing it based on something more than this interview that, or multiple interviews that everybody's on their best behavior. I just think that model is pretty outdated. But again, like we said, it starts and stops with the owner and the culture that and yes. that's the most important thing. Agreed. I would rather hire somebody with a little less qualifications, but who fits the culture versus the perfect, perfectly groomed on paper candidate who's an asshole. Like that's not going to work. Yeah. I was actually going to bring that up where it's like, the one thing I can say is like, listen, you know, if you get 10 applicants, but I always suggest that you get at least somewhere between five and 10 applicants on every position. Right. However, because I've always just, sometimes I, I was the person who would just interview one person to just hire that one person. It was just not a good <laughs> idea, but you hi hire, hire to energy. Yeah. Right. Hire to hire to personality. Right. Instead of specific task work. Right. right. Because you, again, most things 90, per, I believe 90%, at least back, you know, back office work, right. You know, can be easily taught. I mean, that's not exactly difficult, but what you can't teach somebody is how exactly, like you said before, how they react to certain things, their energy, the, the way they communicate. I mean, that stuff, you, you, that's what I would totally, like, that's what I would be focusing on in the interviews and, and trying right. to take off and have good conversations. Um, 
another good thing actually, you know, and I, I've just been thinking about doing this is like invite some possible interviewees to like events where they have, you have to see how out of the shell they can get. If they're, you know, if you're looking for salespeople, if you're looking for back office people, bring them to like a, you know, like I try to like corporate meetings and things like that where, you know, they have to, they have to communicate right off the bat and see how yeah. they handle things. And you'll you know? see how they do also in terms of, I mean, are they going to get wasted, right? Are they going to say stupid stuff? I mean, you can kind of, get a little bit of a gauge on those types of things, which sure. you just can't from the traditional interview. So yeah, I, love I that. totally agree. Cool. Totally so, agree. All right, so we're going to get into the rapid fire questions because I know we're going to try to wrap up sometime soon. Okay. So rapid fire questions are questions that I ask every single guest every single time. And uh, I, they're going to hit home just a little bit differently here. So the first one um, is, Mike, if you had to restart from absolute dead zero, like dead zero, no money, no connections, no nothing, uh, no mentors, all you had was all the wisdom in your head right now, what would you do to completely rebuild everything that you have today? I'd go all in on social media again, 100%, all in. I'd, I'd start building that first. I mean, I definitely would get out there meeting and greeting. You always have to meet and greet, but I would, that would be a big part of all of it because it sort of fits together. And at the end of the day, the currency today is a social channel. I mean, People can bitch about these phones. Can you see it with my background? They can bitch all they want about it, but that's where everybody's doing business, period. They just are. Um, and if you're starting at zero with your hypothetical is no contacts, no connections, no nothing, that's the fastest you can meet people from your couch. I mean, you got to get your ass up off the couch and go to events and get out and meet people. I get that. I'm not saying don't do that, but I would start with building that social presence immediately. I, I agreed. Uh, and it's interesting how... When it comes to a social presence, I feel like people don't realize that it doesn't take a lot to become like a community oh. leader. Nope. Like people like, and again, like I've been really pushing now for quite, you know, maybe just under a year. Yep. Right. And mm -hmm. it's insane how like I get on the phone with some people and the level of authority that I have now is insane. Yeah. They're like, you would give me five minutes of your time. I'm like, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, we're yeah. all, you know, normal human. I'm just saying like the amount of clout that you have, especially when it comes to clients and meeting new people, it's like, if you can really pump out and build a brand online, it does not take a lot or a lot of time, as long as it's consistent that you can right. build up a really good name for yourself. And it's free primary. I mean, mostly, right. I mean, you can, yeah. I'm still doing it on my own. I'm about to bring some people in to kind of I saw a lot of what you were doing. And so I'm going to start doing some more formal production. But at the end of the day, you can make your own videos, which I've done. You can use can you learn how to use Canva over. Yep. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just got to be consistent and get your messaging out there. And it's critical. Very critical. well said. Very yeah. well said. I agree. Uh, okay. Number two, and this is probably going to hit home more than anything. So if today was your last day, Mike, it was your last day and all you had was this very moment right now with me was to share some piece of advice to your friends, your family, your loved ones, uh, your colleagues, what would your piece of advice be? Oh, wow. Am I sharing advice or am I giving my, my thoughts on my your, journey? Which one is it? Uh, just your, your, just again, like if you only had literally just like, you know, a, a couple quick moments here just to share any last words that you'd want to say of just sharing some advice or last words you'd want to share to these people. To make oh, sure it would definitely be, if it's to friends, colleagues, and family, it would definitely be thank you. I mean, abundance of thank you. Um, grateful would be a word I would use, you know, thank you and grateful for everybody that's paid attention, supported, been an ear or a shoulder, an ear to listen or a shoulder to cry on. Or, you know, the mentors, I would include them in my friends and family that have taken time, the people that have acknowledged, you know, my presence and given me their time. Because like you said, the time is all we have, right? So if someone gives me their time, you're giving me your time. That's, that, that's important to me. You know, people have given me their time to podcast with that I didn't know. So all of those people, I would say I'm thank you and grateful for whatever time they gave me. And I hope that I did them proud or did them right. Um, in using that time. Sure. And, and some advice to them? Um, you always remember, you don't know what you don't know. So if someone's imparting advice to you, I think you should listen to it. You may at the end of the day think it's meaningless, but I think it's so important for people to constantly understand that we don't know everything. And even if you're an expert, right, in employment law, I talk to fellow employment lawyers all the time, people I respect, and I learn something new every time. So keep, I guess really to distill it, keep learning, keep learning because you don't know everything, even in your field of expertise. Be a forever student. Yes. 
Try to be, you know, try to be a polymath, right? Really have a good broad base of knowledge, but you said it best, be a forever student constantly, constantly. I love that. Yeah. So, okay. This one, this one's a little selfish for me because I'm curious to get to, uh, to hear it from your perspective. Okay. What is one skill or habit that has been an absolute game changer in your business? Maybe this is something that you've been working on, you know, maybe even super recently, but like, I'm just curious what habits or skills that you're, that you really feel like have helped you. I do the heart, the, I do the things I don't want to do. Not necessarily the hardest things. I was going to say the hardest, but it's not. The things I don't want to do, I do first. I put them on a list and I go, God, I really don't, like today I have to do this response for a client. I don't want to do it. It's not a good case. I did that first today. As soon as I like woke up, you know, got in the groove of things, took care of the dogs. First work task, the thing that I dislike the most, the thing I don't want to do, I do first. And then it's never as bad. Yeah, and then you just I, crush all the shit you want to do. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Super sweet, man. So listen, um, a last couple of things here. So yeah. for, for somebody right now who's thinking about getting into the world of law yeah. and they are you know, maybe just getting out of law school or they're thinking about going to law school and they have that big vision that you've always had, right? right. What is maybe like one or two pieces of advice that you could give maybe to even to your you know, quote unquote younger self? Uh, in law school, make sure you become tight with and stay tight with your classmates because they're going to send you a bunch of business down the road for sure. They will be 100% your best resources. No question about it. Second piece of advice is I would start building the social presence immediately, starting with law school. Law students, I, the ones I see on LinkedIn, they're posting about their exams. They're posting about whatever they're doing. And they're the ones I think that are getting attention. And that's what this world is, unfortunately, right? You want to get hired at big places, you got to grab attention however you can get it. So I would tell them, start building the brand immediately. Love that so much. <laughs> and um, so and I also, I want to get uh, two cents from you on this last point. Somebody right now who's working for, a, um, I'll call it a larger firm. Yeah. Right. Or a salesperson who's lurk, working for a big brokerage. Right. And it's just right. like, and, they, and they're thinking about going out and building it on their own. They're thinking like you were thinking back in the day, right. Yeah. Of like, Oh, I could go do this all on my own now. What would you say to them? Go for it. Just do it. And, and my big thing is it's never, never going to be the right time. There's never the right time. There is always going to be some reason to not do it. The economy, you've got 16 mortgages, you just had a new baby, you just got divorced, you just got a new girlfriend, whatever. That shit ain't going away. So tomorrow, today, just do it. Just start. What's the worst thing that happens? You fail, you start again. That, I, I, mean, I mean that sincerely. Because when I opened my law firm the second time around, it was not an ideal time to do it. It was really not the right time for me. And it turned out to be the right time. <laughs> so I, I think it's so powerfully said again, you know, it's just, uh, listen, go for your dreams. Nobody else yeah. is going to build them for you. Right. And it's just like every day that you're hesitant on it is another day you, that you're not living to your fullest potential. Another day that you're robbing the world of what you can achieve. Life right? is so, imperfect, right? There's always a thing that you could look at and go, this isn't the right time. I have a family member who's sick or I, it, there's always going to be that go for it. Just go for it. Cause otherwise you're going to wake up one day or not wake up and realize you lost all that time. I think that's a powerful way to end this podcast. That's yeah. so amazing. Thank you so much, my friends. Thanks, so listen, Great so everyone you. out there, yeah, likewise, listen, thank you so much for listening to episode 11 of the Step 1 Podcast. We hope this uh, episode gave you the ideas, the motivation, and the strategies you needed to take your first step or your next steps in business and in life. So go out there and crush it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, man.